Right, now hopefully you can now see uh, my talk. Um, and it's about form and function, the history of a chemical laboratory. Now, my argument is that form follows function. And the design of a chemical laboratory is a result of what it's being used for. And sorry, I'm having to let people in. I might not be. Hmm. Right. Now, uh, but at the same time, the design and fitting of a chemical laboratory create what a chemist can do. Hence, the development of chemistry is partly the development of a chemical laboratory. That is my key argument. By a chemical laboratory, I simply mean a space used for scientific purposes by chemists. I will make a distinction here between the laboratory itself and the laboratory building, which houses the laboratory. Because the laboratory building contains not just the laboratory itself, but other rooms such as rooms for spectroscopy, lecture rooms, libraries and offices. You all know what I mean, you've all probably been in one. I make this distinction because these buildings are often called laboratories. For example, the Dyson Perrin Laboratory in Oxford refers to the building rather than a specific um, laboratory within that building. When this can cause confusion. Here I will focus on the chemical laboratory. But the physical laboratory and the biological laboratory grew out of a chemical laboratory in the mid-19th century. That will be a completely different talk whatsoever. I will also start in the mid 18th century, as this is when the modern chemical laboratory first started to take place. We can begin by saying that the term laboratory was first used in Latin and then in English in the late 16th century, the time of Shakespeare. In fact, one of the first uses of the word laboratory in English appeared in the stage direction of Ben Johnson's play, Mercury Vindicated from the Alchemist which he wrote in 1615. So one of the first appearances of the word laboratory was in a play, I suppose that uh, uh, told her something, I'm not quite sure what. Anyhow, this new laboratory grew out of the alchemist workshop, which was largely centered on the furnace. The, having done that, the design of the laboratory remained remarkably stable. William Lewis's laboratory in the, sorry, I'm just going to, um, now there you can see an old pattern laboratory in a modern laboratory. And this is the laboratory as it first, when the term laboratory first started in the 1580, it's an assaying laboratory for metal work, metallurgical work, I should rather say. And this is William Lewis's laboratory in 1763 on Kingston upon Thames. Now, what we note about it is that there are several furnaces, and not just one furnace, but in fact, there are at least four or five, six, seven, I think there's even more, maybe even more as many as 10 furnaces, all in the same room. But there's no storage space. All the apparatus and probably the chemicals and the balance and the, all stuck on trails or window sills or even on the fireplace. There's no basic storage space, nor indeed, if you look very hard at the picture, is there any real space for the poor old chemist to work on? Now there's a couple of benches along the wall, but uh, there's no clear working space. He probably worked mainly on the furnace. So what you might call tidy clutter. It's a laboratory for an individual chemist, carrying out a number of different tasks using a large array of equipment, perhaps, perhaps, with the help of an assistant or an apprentice. Now, let us turn to a, a modern type laboratory. This is the kitchen laboratory at DTH Zurich in 1905. Not the very first of its type I might have, but a particularly good picture. You will all recognize this picture. You will recognize the aisle in the middle, the benches, the bottle racks, the fume cupboards, which in, that, in those days were uh, next to the windows because the gases just went out the window, and the wash basin and the lamps on top of the benches, of course, in those days, there were gas and not electricity. 
This is the kind of laboratory where it may look quite antiquated to us. It's a type that we can recognize. In contrast to um, William Lewis's laboratory, we wouldn't recognize at all. So, how did it come about? Well, between the 1760s and 1860, there was no universally agreed type of laboratory. But the classical laboratory, as I like to call it, started to come into shape, started to appear. The first moving force in all of this was the rise of gas chemistry, pneumatic chemistry, in the 1770s. It did not need much heat and it did not need furnaces, but it did need flat spaces for apparatus and specialist equipment to capture in the gases. Antoine Lavoisier's laboratory at the Paris Arsenal in the 1790s, which we can see in this picture, was markedly different from Lewis's laboratory only 40 years earlier. The furnace is largely up, I think there is one somewhere in the corner there, and um, there are tables and a special water tank laboratory for um, collecting gases. And you see there's a certain amount of order in this laboratory. There are pigeon holes and trowel for holding apparatus and chemicals. Furthermore, there is another sort of order in this laboratory. Everybody in this laboratory had a clear role to play, from the assistant on the left-hand side, the experimental subject, next to him, the experimentalist standing next to the experimental subject, another assistant working on the water tank, and of course we've got Madame Lavassier in the corner making the note. And above all of them, in the sense metaphorically, you have the person in the middle next to the globe, Antoine Lavassier, the director of the experiment. So, as the trail trail, Lavassier's laboratory sprang from a different tradition from that of the alchemist. Um, sorry, I'm having to admit people. Um, it was a laboratory that sprang from physics, and in particular, the physics laboratory, the physics cabinet. I won't go into that, that is a tradition connected to physics, which has, rather more so than chemistry, has retained the tables and racking used by Lavassier. Now, we move on to another more recognisable type of chemical laboratory, which is the big famous laboratory in Giessen, Germany in 1842. This, of course, is a very iconic picture. It has, several chemical, it has several similarities with what we would regard as a laboratory today. On the left hand corner, you can see a, a bottle rack, but it's a bottle rack behind the glass shelf. You can see the cupboard under the benches, you can see the drawers under the benches, you can see people working at the bench. In some cases, in some cases more industriously than others. You also see the laboratory assistant in the middle of the room. So, what is different? What is different is but they've still got tables. And of course, there's no gas or running water. There is, however, a fume cupboard. It's not very recognizable, but if you look at the very back of the room, you will see uh, the fume cupboards, which have basically got little glass panes in them. But they're the very, some of the very earliest fume cupboards, and I'll come back to that. But the key thing here is that you've got several people who are hard at work basically all doing the same kind of task. And that's what one of the fundamental features that we recognize in a chemical laboratory. And this is a period when chemical work became increasingly systematized, whether it be the combust analysis of Liebig himself or the group of analysis of metallic salt, which was often the practice given to chemistry students in those days. And this brings me to another important point. Chemistry, both organic and inorganic, were becoming increasingly dangerous. Bunton himself lost his eye in the laboratory explosion. And film cupboards were needed to avoid death and injury. This danger was increased in the 1840s by the introduction of group analysis, as it used the highly toxic gas hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide is so toxic that it's surprising that it was a standard feature of the laboratory for even most of the 20th century, and even in school. It was generated by the iconic Kipps apparatus. Here's a picture of an early kit apparatus, soon after it was invented. The early fume cupboards were relatively inefficient. Indeed, it's true today that many laboratories 
had very inefficient film coverage even when I was a student, and that was only 50 years ago. And was it was usually dependent on the draft produced by a native flame like a candle. Hardly an ideal process to be using as an EPA stovent or like EPA, for example. Yet, we have not yet reached the classical laboratory. To have the classical laboratory as we know it, you need to have no furnace, you need to get rid of a furnace, and you need to have modern utilities such as pipes in water and gas. They had not yet arrived in Gießen. The modern bench and laboratory rack first appeared in two laboratories in London. For its own much to Gießen, namely the laboratory of the Pharmaceutical Society in 1845, and you can see the film cupboard in the back here. Here's the film cupboard, rather small looking thing. And um, you've got the bottle racks, you've got the benches, you've got, you know, uh, filter funnels and all sorts of things like that. This is beginning to look like the sort of laboratory we know. And that's also true of Burbeck laboratory at UCL in 1846. Firmly built on the Gerson model. We're beginning to see Bentry. We're beginning to see lots of people working in Bentry. We're even beginning to see laboratory stores. This is beginning to be the sort of laboratory that we know, but it's not yet. We're not there yet. This is 1846. We have not yet reached it. Hold on. So, it was Robert Bunsen in Hyderabad in 1855, who first created the laboratory, which is understandably the same as the one that we have today. Um, sorry, I'm just looking to see someone coming up and chat. Now, there are things we recognize. You can see the uh, bottle rack of our still behind the um, glass front there. We've got a bench, we've got a, a wash basin, we've got cupboard, we've got drawers. It's all beginning to look pretty good. It's even got running water and gas. I, I mentioned that again in a moment. But there's one big difference. The wastewater runs into a barrel. The poor assistant had to take the barrel out every so often and pour it down an outside drain. We're not quite yet at the modern laboratory. But the introduction of pipe water and running gas, or should I say pipe gas and running water, was a crucial stage in the development of the laboratory. And Bunsen went even one stage further. He had developed an early type of carbon zinc battery he put a gigantic one in the basement and he ran the DC electricity into the laboratory along the water pipe. Better make sure you don't have both the hot and cold at the same time. So, things are really moving on. Gas enabled Bunsen to develop the Bunsen burner. And, uh, hmm. and this is a drawing by Beatrice Potter uh, for her uncle Harry, Henry Rocco in 1899, and Rocco, of course, helped Bunsen and the, the laboratory technician, Peter de Saga, to develop the Bunsen burner in around 1855, at the time this new laboratory opened. And water, the running water enabled Bunsen to develop what I will call the filter pump, but I'm told by various people could, should be called the, the water aspirator. We all know what it is. It's a bit the thing with rubber shoes that you stick on your laboratory tap to operate your filter. Both of these, the Bunsen burner and the filter pump, played a major role in chemistry over the next century or so. As a consequence of the hot flame of the Bunsen burner, Bunsen and his physics colleague Gustav Kirchhoff were able to develop the new field of atomic spectroscopy. I'm not saying in case anybody really gets worked up about this. I'm not saying they invented atomic spectroscopy, but they certainly made it into a standard laboratory and indeed astrophysical technique. But Bunsen was also one of the first people, one of the first chemists, to build a laboratory building rather than a single laboratory. This building contained specialized room for techniques such as gas analysis, another field that he helped to develop, and electro hall. The chemists were beginning to be part of a community of scientists and technicians, rather than the solitary worker of the early 18th century. However, and this is often overlooked, in fact almost invariably overlooked, it was the introduction of pipe steam in 
pioneered that London Apocryphy Laboratory in the 1820s, but only widely introduced in the 1860s, but finally removed for the alchemist furnace and allowed the classical laboratory to appear. Another important development in the 1860s was the introduction of plumb drainage into the laboratory, removing the need for the barrels I showed you that need to be regularly emptied. Now, during the second half of the 19th century, much effort was put into forced ventilation of laboratories. I professors became aware of the reluctance of students and researchers to use film cupboards. If indeed they even had enough film cupboards, because most laboratories didn't, and certainly most chemists didn't want to bother with film cupboards. But the draft of this forced ventilation conflicted with the draft in the film cupboard, largely leading to the abandonment of the idea into the use of electrical fans both in the laboratory and in the fume cupboard solved the problem in the early 20th century. Now, professors were also trying to promote safety by creating spaces for outdoor experiments. Either a space, by the way, sorry, I should have shown you, this is the U laboratory building in Hardeberg with the famous old castle in the background. And here we come to the normal school of science in South Kensington in 1871, which is now the Henry Co wing of the VNA, or more or less opposite the science museum. And if you look at the log ears on the top there, these log ears are not just there to be a pretty decoration, or even for maybe a bit of our fresco picnicking at some point. No, these have a serious scientific purpose. They're meant for open air experiments. They weren't used for very, very long, I have to say, but uh, that was their intention. And you could use the roof. Some laboratories had a ladder and an opening onto the roof, so you could carry out your experiment on the roof. Why bother going up? You could equally well go outside, and you could just simply do your dangerous experiment in the outside of the laboratory. And in fact, this went on as late in 1974, and perhaps even later in East Germany. And here we see an outdoor experiment being carried out at Rostock University in 1974. So, um, where do we go from here? Well, these open air experiments tend to die out as the film cupboards got better. And, um, but there was another problem as well, and that is that more and more students, more and more workers, how do you fit them all in? And that required the severe rationalization of space in the laboratory, which was not a consideration, as you can see, for uh, back in the 1760s. So the laboratory, the classical laboratory of the 1860s and 1870s, had an aisle down the middle with, with benches in each side. You've seen this sort of arrangement before, haven't you? This is a hospital ward. This is essentially how you organize beds in a hospital. And just as you organise beds in the hospital to make the maximum use, but also safe use of the space, you do the same in the chemical laboratory. So you have benches, all a safe distance from each other, more or less, and with an hour up and down the middle, where the professor can stride up and down and make sure that everybody is doing their work properly, maybe. Now, the rise of new techniques such as gas analysis, combustion analysis for organic compound, pioneered by Liebig, Spectroscopy, pioneered by Banton and polarimetry, created the need for specialist rooms separate from the laboratory itself. As the chemistry department grew, and I've got a picture here, the here to combustion analysis room at Zurich, usually kept well away from everywhere else because it's very hot and dangerous and smelly, and I'll come to that one in a moment. But you have um, bigger and bigger buildings, and the director of that big building becomes important. And in Germany, at least, the new classical laboratory would often have living, lavish living quarters for the director. In Berlin, it was a fairly conflicted site. There was still room for a ballroom for Hoffman. Now, one feature of a chemical laboratory, scarcely known today, was the chemical museum. Now, I must emphasize, and I must emphasize this particularly when I my book, that this is not a history of science type museum. We're not talking of something like the chemistry galleries uh, in the Science Museum in London or the Science History Institute in Philadelphia. No, this was more like a geological laboratory. And its purpose was explicitly pedagogic. It was for teaching, it wasn't for show. 
that typically contain compound apparatus and models, but also the product of chemistry research is porcelain or fertilizer. They were not for visitors, they were for teaching, and therefore an orphan near a lecture theatre for obvious reasons. In fact, what a professor would do is give the lecture and then the students would troop out to see what he was talking about in the museum. Although the early ones were often simply repositories of chemicals, by the end of the 19th century, especially in the USA, where they were particularly popular, there were museums of applied chemistry with the sample provided by manufacturers. Now, this is the Lee Big University Chemical Museum, a particularly big example of one. In fact, it was set up by the brother of Charles Chandler, who had a very famous museum at Columbia University in New York, which still exists in a very, very uh, modified form. In fact, many of these chemical museums were set up because the chemical manufacturer came to the university and said, we want your student to see our product because we want your student to work for us after they leave you. So, you know, in some, many cases, universities were willy nilly more or less forced to have chemical museums. And they were very common. I would say that possibly at least half the university by the 1890s had a chemical museum, possibly even more. There are now some that would have been almost completely forgotten. Now, here's one even in Japan the Museum of Applied Chemistry at the Imperial University Tokyo in 1900. Very lavish indeed, and visited by the emperor. So, for important visitors, yes, but mainly for the use of students and researchers. The heyday of the Chemical Museum was between 1860 and 1920, when nearly every chemistry department either had a chemical museum or said they needed a chemical museum. And professors would go to Europe and indeed even all around the world to get samples and objects for their museum. But by the 1950s, a new generation of chemists came along who didn't really understand what the chemical museums were for and teaching had moved on. The people were now learning about quantum mechanics and organic reaction mechanisms and not the product of applied chemistry. So the library just closed down and the one at Illinois, for example, was converted into part of the library, or they got stuck in the foyer, where they had a purely historical interest, but I must emphasize that was not at all the original purpose. Nowadays, there's hardly any chemical museums anywhere. The, the one in Edinburgh is now partly a coffee room, and that is about the last one in the world. An object, a, a, a space, a space in the chemical laboratory building, was for one almost reversal had now almost completely disappeared. Let us dwell upon that. Now, once the classical laboratory had been established in Germany, mainly but not entirely by Wilhelm Hoffmann in his laboratories in Berlin and Bonn, here is the fronting of the chemical industry in Bonn in 1903. No wonder that William Cook and Chemical U exclaimed that Hoffmann were creating a chemical laboratory of an entirely new kind, a chemical palette, no longer a cellar uh, or pokey hoe of the alchemist, but a variable palette, a palette to the triumph of chemistry, if you might say. They were then copied by other, other countries. Other countries wanted these chemical palettes. And Hoffman helped them. He would give advice, he would share design. He had no, he had no wish to keep the design for himself but he did want his design to be there. Notable examples include the normal school of science in South Kensington. By the way, let me just say, you know, where the background, the normal here is in the French Ecole Normale, which is, that means a institution for teaching teachers. It doesn't imply that some kinds of science are normal and others aren't, hmm. just as well. Uh, and then there's Lehigh University in Pennsylvania and the U laboratory we've seen at Zurich Federal Polytechnic in the 1890s. However, not all the American universities followed the German model closely. Some like Lehigh did, as you can see here, but others and less so. I mean, the laboratory at MIT is somewhat different from the others. There's no, there's not so many laboratory benches, uh, bottle racks, I mean, sorry, there's not so many bottle racks 
they look like if it could be removed, if you wish, like at the bench at the very front, there's no bottle right there. And there isn't an owl. All the benches are to one side. Well, we'll return to this type of laboratory soon. So the Americans had always were a little bit different. This room, however, is the great charm for Hoffman. Because in the 1890s, the French, yes, the French, the French, but they've been defeated in the French Prussian War and really hated the Germans at this point. Even the French turned to Hoffman for advice on how you built a blended chemical laboratory. And he helped them. He wasn't worried they were friends. He was delighted to help them. And they were very old by this time, but he put a lot of effort into helping to design the new laboratory of the Tobol. How is that? Even in France, they adopted the German model. And they adopted the German model because it works. And we still use that basic model today because it works. I'll return to that point soon. There's in in some places like Portugal, for example, they still tended to go towards the table type of laboratory. But even in places like Portugal and Italy, where the type of laboratory that used table rather than benches, which more or less swept away. So, it went further than that. So far, I've been talking about academic laboratory, but it wasn't just academic laboratory. This model, this new model of the classical laboratory, was used in other types of places as well. Despite the fact that we're doing different kinds of things, of course. Now, if we look at the bio laboratory at Alba Field in the 1890s, well, it's a bit basic, isn't it? In fact, the roof looks like it was going to fall down any moment. Uh, it's got a corrugated roof. All the benches are packed closely together. There isn't an awful lot of light. I can't see any fume covered for them, there must be some. But there were the bottle wraps. There are the benches. You know, this is still the classical laboratory, despite the industrial setting. And then we look at BASF in 1922, but a laboratory that was built much earlier, you see the academic classical laboratory. It's exactly the same. And incidentally, the chemists in this picture are wearing lab coats. That's another subject I could talk about sometime. Lab coats are much more modern than we think. It's a fairly modern thing, the lab coat, and particularly the, the white lab coat. But that's something for another time. And here we come to the main laboratory at the Clement Inn Laboratory just off the Strand, uh, which was built in 1897 for the laboratory of a government chemist. Now, the laboratory of a government chemist was a government laboratory that focused on things like food safety and uh, making sure that you could analyze the things you need to tax, like tobacco, for example. So part of it, part of it, remit was tax avoidance or tax evasion. The proposal would be tax evasion. Anyway. This is a very interesting laboratory because it's not for it's not for academic chemistry, it's not even for industrial chemistry, it's a kind of trained chemistry of its own. But the man who built it, Sir Edward Ford, always known as Tommy Ford since he got knighted and then he became Sir Edward Ford, he had a background and his background was initially at Manchester with Bosco. But at Leeds, he built um, laboratories just before he left for the laboratory of the government chemist in the 1890s. And these laboratories are based on the laboratories of Herman Kobe in Leipzig. One interesting thing about, I hope you see me okay, I'm getting this message about, okay, the, the unstable connection disappeared again. You can see a woman on one of the benches there, which is quite interesting, and that's way back in 1908. And this is what, now, if you go back to, say, that is the laboratory of a government chemist in, in, Clement, in Clement's Inn. And this is Kobe teaching laboratory in Leipzig in 1872, about the same time as Hoffman's laboratory. And we should give Hope Kobe some credit to what is Hoffman. Although Kobe did less to propagate the new time of the laboratory. But it's almost the same. I mean, if you look at them, pretty much the same. Look at the doors, for example. So what had initially been a model for the academic laboratory had moved into industry and then moved into government. It was a very versatile model of laboratory. Okay, between the laboratory, uh, between the 1890s when the Zurich Polytechnic Laboratory was built and the 1980s, 1980s, there is little to say. And the design was so successful, it's Gertie trained. 
for many years, uh, um, uh, for many, this is a laboratory in 1950, and you can see for about an industrial laboratory, and probably like the bio laboratory, a bit more basic and a bit more crowded than an, an academic laboratory would be. Nonetheless, it's the same sort of laboratory that existed in the 19 in the 1870s, except for the fact that, of course, that by this time they'd introduced electric light. And there were more women working in it as well. Now, um, let me give you an example of how things were very limited. Main electricity was introduced in the 1890s, but it only had very little effect on the laboratory. For many years, the main consumer of electricity in the chemical laboratory was to project the lamp in the lecture hall. The main benefit of electricity was for ventilation and fume coverage, as I already mentioned, and for lighting, as this picture shows. Although Cambridge University at the used gas lighting into the 1940s. Now, the main driving force in the post-war period was the improvement of the bench. Using new material, either compressed asbestos cement, oh dear, or phenolic rodent, and the ergonomic arrangement of the bentry to make the best use of increasingly crowded laboratories and to simplify the supply of utilities. Now, one effect of this was that the benches were moved towards the wall or to the window to create what are called peninsular benches rather than having a central aisle that we saw in Zurich. Now, this type of design was used in the used Stauffer laboratories at Stanford, labor at Stanford University in California, I'm sure you know it, in 1961. The Stanford laboratory showed how the chemical, the classical laboratory could accommodate the new physical instrumentation which was then introduced in the 1950s. Before we move on to look at that, I will mention the, the trap at the very front of this picture. I forget his name, I'm sorry about that, but he looks a bit like Vladimir Putin, if you think about it, and in fact he was a Russian chemist. And the trap in front of him looked rather British, and he was British, he was from Imperial College. So this is an American laboratory, but it had a Russian chemist on one bench and a British chemist on another bench. It shows how international American chemistry was becoming, even as early as 1961. Also, note the similarity, about very different in many respects, note the similarity to the MIT laboratory I showed you earlier. Let's go, go quickly back here. And there's MIT, 1893, South uh, in 1961. You can see the similarity, uh, even though there are differences. Now, this new implementation, big, heavy, and a mass spectrometer, or mass spectrometer, even more so. But actually, uh, this is at the South, and then South, what they did was they put all the, all the sort of um, NMRs and choreography and everything like that, they put it right in the middle of the building. So all the laboratory surrounded what you might call the service area. That was an idea of Carter acid. But they're very heavy. And it's not inconvenient that the combustion room, which had usually been in the basement of older laboratories, was very convenient for NMR machines and mass spectrometers that replaced them. So the old design was incredibly flexible. But when the second phase of the Stauffer Laboratory at Stanford was completed in 1963, the basement connecting the two laboratory buildings was used to house all this heavy equipment. So that was a clever use. That was a clever use of basement as well, a rather different one from the old classical laboratory. So, I've already said, the classical laboratory survived, more or less untrained, with new equipment and new chemists and so forth, up to the 1980s. That's remarkable. That's 120 years. But in the 1990s, things started to trend. This new type of laboratory, which I'll discuss in a moment, arose in the pharmaceutical industry. And it arose partly because the introduction of a suspended bench or C frame from its shape allowed a more flexible design for laboratories. Here's a modern picture of C frame, a you know, photograph by the manufacturer. 
I put this picture in because A, you will recognize it, I hope, although in the absence of any bottles or equipment, you might not. But you can also see why it's called a C-frame. You can also use an opposite in places like that. But it created greater flexibility. You've replaced a big, heavy rocking bench with a main mobile C-frame. I mean, literally mobile. Although they don't have casters, C-frame can have casters. Not ideal in the laboratory, though. Drawing from their experience of manufacturers, the pharmaceutical industry was also very concerned with health and safety and had the fund to build an entirely type of new type of laboratory. The key year was 1995, when what was then called Pfizer Pharmaceutical, which is now AstraZeneca in Loughborough, and the Welcome, that's a Welcome in Harlow, opened new laboratory buildings. I actually went to the opening of the Pfizer Pharmaceutical uh laboratory and i would have loved to have shown you a picture of it but unfortunately i couldn't find one but while i was looking for a picture of it i was reminded of course it was opened by john major himself who was prime minister at the time and the reason he opened it was because the consistency the laboratory was in the consistency of the minister of health stephen Dole. so obviously that connection helped so one of the first academic laboratory to be built to this new model was well, at Oxford. And Oxford, of course being Oxford, went one better than Pfizer and Pharmaceuticals. And they didn't have John Major, who was no longer Prime Minister by then, of course, but they had the Queen. And next to the Queen, looking very pleased with himself, obviously, uh, is Graham Richard, who was the leading force uh, behind this um, new type of laboratory. And it's a very interesting financing model for this uh, laboratory because Graham Richard was one of the pioneers of spin-off. And basically it was partly partly paid for by um, allowing spin-off ventures, capitalists, to have a share of an Oxford spin-off if they were prepared to put some money towards building this new laboratory. Graham Richard did ask the you know, the I've forgotten what was the time for each counter, but anyway, whatever the relevant Research Council was, he did ask for the entire budget for one year to pay for the laboratory, but of course they told them to F off. Uh, now, oh, what's new about this? Well, firstly, you notice that you've got all these offices, which are offices rather than uh, just a sort of base of the laboratory. Where are the laboratories, you might ask? Well, the laboratories are behind the wall on the right. Now, part of it is whiteboard, so people can write interesting structures on the whiteboard, which you can just about make out from this picture. But also you can see windows, and they're windows rather than just a plain wall, because they wanted people to be able to see into the laboratory. So if a poor researcher gets overcome by some fume, somebody typing away in the computer can say, oh my God, somebody collapsed in the laboratory, better um, get the emergency help. So it's a safety feature. And another feature of this new type of laboratory is to have an atrium. Now this atrium has a purpose too. It divides the laboratories, which are on the left, from the offices, which are on the right. Again, you have the separation of clean and dirty spaces. The offices are clean. How do I know they're clean? Apart from the fact that obviously they are clean, but they've got carpet. Clean areas have carpet. Dirty areas have lino. That's how you can know. Why a cafe in the atrium? The idea there comes from sociology, but sociologists of science have shown that people work better when they can talk, from, talk to people from different areas of the subject. So the idea of a cafe, if a chemist from doing different things can meet up and chat and get ideas off each other, it is no accident, it's all deliberate. And here we have the laboratory. You will recognize it, of course, the mahogany Ventures of the 1890s have been replaced by white composite material, a bit like IKEA, really. And you've still got bottle racks, although they're hardly the same as the old one. This must have been taken at Christmas, actually, given the tinsel along the bottle rack. But you can see that it's quite small. And that's one of the features of a modern laboratory they're small, they're not big. Laboratory got bigger and bigger, and now they've got smaller. We also have fume cupboards. 
Now I've locked the view from it. Even this tiny laboratory, which is hardly much bigger than the average room, has four film cupboards in it, and a very long film cupboards as well. Practically all the work now is done in the film cupboard. Now this is true, of course, of organic chemistry. Maybe in an inorganic chemistry or some type of radio chemistry, they just take out the film cupboard and put it in a glove box instead. The whole emphasis on this is flexibility. Flexible utility, flexible equipment. If you really wanted to, uh, you could take out the whole laboratory and turn them into offices. There's nothing to stop you doing that. You just take out the unit and put in some carpet and a desk and computers and it becomes an office. It can be done. Flexibility is key. About health and safety as well. I'll come back to that. So whereas academic laboratories of the 1950s and 1960s have specialised rooms for cases for the routine needs of researchers and high-end research, the laboratories now have more specialised rooms across the Lano floored corridor, remember it's a dirty area, will contain instruments such as NMR or HPLC hyphen MS machine. Now, how can they be used by the researchers? In the past, they've always said, hey, you know, can't have researchers doing their own NMR or uh, mass spectrometry, Ooh, that leads to terrible trouble. Ha ha, the way they do it, if it is sampled or automatically loaded into the machine and the results are recorded automatically and sent to your PC or maybe even your iPad these days. Now, that means that the researcher can leave the sample for the machine, but they don't operate the machine. And that's the key difference. And that brings me, of course, I'm a tired, but you still have enormous mass spectrometers, enormous uh, and the MR machine is enormous, they are really enormous. And also automated, automated X-ray crystallography in the basement. That still goes on, but all the average NMR and mass spec and so on, but an average organic researcher, can one have an average organic researcher? That's all done in a little room behind the laboratory. So what is the future of a company laboratory? One lesson to be drawn from this talk is the remarkable stability of a chemical laboratory over the century. The sort of alchemist type laboratory lasted from 1580 to roughly 1820. So that's about 240 years. Actually rather more than that. The classical laboratory lasted from 1860 up to, well even today really, but certainly up to 2000 or so. That's about 140 years. So you have a remarkably long period of time when you're talking about an area within time. But the other thing I need to emphasize is that change occurred because of what was possible. The classical laboratory were made possible by pipe gas and running water and pipe steam. It wasn't an accident, nor was it just a change of design. Certain things had to happen to make the classical laboratory possible. In recent years, however, there's been an ever-growing emphasis on health and safety in the laboratory, which, as we've seen in the case of Oxford, has already affected laboratory design, and will surely continue to do so, because we now put a lot of emphasis on health and safety, and rightly so, surely. As science becomes more and more inter multidisciplinary and integrated, the fume cupboard will surely remain as a distinctive feature of a chemical laboratory. So if you were to ask me in say 20 or 30 years time, well what's a chemical laboratory at the same from any other kind of laboratory? And I would say to you, does it have a fume cupboard? And you would say, yes it does. And I would say that's a chemical laboratory. Some people might disagree with me, but that's my argument. But if we go further forward, what if we talk about 50 years time? 2050, 2070, whatever. What will be done? Well, if we're assuming that health and safety is paramount, and surely it will be, and that there's an increasing tendency in the world at large to work at home, and I first wrote that comment several years ago before COVID-19, so if it were true then, it's certainly true now. The future may lie with robotics. By the way, this is the NMR room in the area behind the laboratory I'm talking about, and this is a robotic synthesizer in the chemical research laboratory at Oxford, robotics. 
Already, some of them are working in the laboratory, like working in the MR machine, are uh, robotic and largely automated. And the next step must surely be to automate the running of the experiment himself. Why automate everything else if you're not automating the um, experiment? This has already been done to some extent in the well funded pharmaceutical industry, and this is likely to continue and develop. The idea of carrying out an experiment from the comfort of your home office may seem a strange concept to many chemists, even today. Yet, in principle, it's no different from operating the movement of a rover across the Martin surface from home, or at least a remote office. If one wishes to create a completely safe laboratory, and surely that must be our ultimate aim, is it not? The best way to do this is to remove the chemist from the laboratory. As I know well myself, humans often make error prone experimentalists, and they are fragile, subject to injury from exploding glassware and from poisoning by the chemicals they're using, even with film companies. Now, some chemists might argue that remote controlled experiments are not real chemistry. I might add, by the way, there's no technological issue here. I'm sure technological issue would be quite easy. But they might argue that it's not real chemistry. How can you say that? a chemical experiment carried out by a robot a thousand miles away is chemistry, really. <laughs> Yet, the alchemists of the 16th century, and probably many schoolmasters of the 19th century, would argue that modern chemistry, with all its fume cupboards and its handling of particularly dangerous substances in glove boxes, is not real chemistry either. After all, you're not at risk of dying, so if you're not at risk of dying, it's not really chemistry, is it? I leave you with that thought. The future may lie with robots. Now, I will try to answer some of your questions and put your questions in chat. Now, part of the trouble when you are both the host and giving the talk, it's quite difficult to operate, but we've managed so far. And so, I now want your questions, which I will access. Okay. Starting from the beginning. Uh, here we are, from Henry. Hi, Henry. Peter, when did cryogenic liquid N2O2 gradually become, or gradually become available in the laboratory? Well, I suppose a little bit depends on the word general here, but certainly Ramsey was using cryogenic liquid in the 1890s and 1900s. And I think, um, you know, by the 1920s, there were generally available. I think one has to perhaps ask a slightly different question. When the chemist first think of using cryogenic liquids in experiment? A slightly different question, and certainly not one I'm going to answer. No. No, I'm not going to answer. No, I'm just saying for Oxford structure is brilliant. Well, yes, thank you. What Faraday, Henry again. What part of the forefront of laboratory is down at the Royal Institute and what doing chemistry there? The answer is no, you quite definitely no, because the laboratory he used was, was built before he got there. And in fact, it was a laboratory meant for um, lecture demonstration. I, I write about this in my book, which I'll show a copy of at the end, so you can all rush out to Amazon and buy a copy. If you haven't already got it, which of course you should have. In which case, if you have got it, you probably didn't need to talk, no more. No, uh, Faraday wasn't particularly at the forefront of the laboratory design, and in fact, his laboratory was not particularly helpful to him. It's wonderful what they do in bad laboratories. Uh, now, for Arthur Mackenzie, very interesting. Can you comment on the scaling up required for um, industrial production? Is it more appropriate to call the industrial facility a factory? I'm not quite sure I understand the question here. I mean, certainly scaling up is a very big issue. And it's a subject in itself, a massive subject in itself. Because, of course, the properties of chemicals on the large scale are nothing like the properties on the smaller scale, and so forth and so on. It's a major subject of its own. But the laboratories I showed were not of that type. They were research laboratories where they were just simply doing research of the same type that academics do, but obviously for uh, industrial purposes. So, with, with respect, it's not quite the same thing, I don't think. Uh, if you want to, Alex, uh, if you want to comment on that, please do so. Now, what's the next one? 
Uh, ah, Robert Flynn says you may have some photos of Python pharmaceutical. Well, Robert, if you want to send them to me by email, uh, I would quite like to have them because if I give a talk like this again, uh, it might be useful. I'm not sure I will, but uh, Lee Cronin apparently has an interesting take on the future of chemical laboratory. Do email me the references, Henry, sounds very interesting. Ah, right. Hamda also asked me, do I think the pandemic will change the boundaries and how? Well, that's a good question, and that's what partly what I was implying at uh, towards the end of my talk. Um, certainly, we have more pandemics, uh, pandemics than other things, uh, I think it's quite likely, unfortunately. I think the world has to change. Um, on the basis of this pandemic alone, uh, laboratory design and chemists with a uh, conservative with a small C, I think it will take some time, but I certainly think robotics will come sometime. I think it's just inevitable from a safety point of view. There was very much, uh, Andrew Turton, hello Andrew, say that there was very much a trip from work chemistry and teaching lab in the 1970s to instrumental method of Analysis. Remember quantitative and qualitative within organic analysis and the Midland Association for and so on. Um, the 1974 health and safety work at put the damper on fun experiments. Yes, this is a sad case. Um, over in you know, obviously a great deal of concern in school laboratory, which is not hard to understand when you consider that in the 1960s school laboratory school laboratory was still using benzene and hydrogen sulfide and in some cases even hydrogen cyanide but uh, yes it, it's a sad thing but I'm afraid we're probably pretty stuck with it at least if the robots can do the fun experiment for us we can get back to that to some degree. Yeah. Cronin claims to have written a new computer language for coding chemistry at oh yes I have heard of this actually in the context of uh, retro synthetic design uh coding chemistry experiment in control by computers well yeah and that's word of the robotics i mean it's, it's, it's so crazy in a way well I mean, you know ultimately you just come up with some tremendously complicated chemical you want to make type of type of structure in the computer works out how to make it or the, the chemical would probably be delivered by robots like a bit like a Cato now and then the robot to make it for you how terribly boring so much data yeah, day to look forward to, really. If, like me, you're not good at this sort of thing. Dial a molecule, yes, indeed. And they all you have to do to combine dial a molecule with um, the robot and roll out of a job, really. Hmm. I mean, somebody has to think about it a little bit before they type it in. Well, is there any more questions? We've got a couple of minutes for more. Well, I hope you've enjoyed that. Um, I've enjoyed giving it. And... Um, it's always fun to talk about the history of laboratories. Let me just um how do I um got there? Right, so I will just end up now by recommending my book that we all um yeah, here it is. The matter factory. Hope you can see it okay. It looks back to front to me actually. But the matter factory. Published by the action books. And available for more good books than it, but basically these days means Amazon. Sorry about that. Maybe hate Amazon now, I apologize. Um, it should be £25, but frankly, you should get it for £15 or less. And when you consider whether it's about the uh, 400 odd pages and got lots of pictures, lots and lots of pictures, some of which never seen before, it's pretty good value, if I may say so, compared with some of these books published by Springer that cost 80 or 90 quid and they were near as good. So I recommend you buy it if you haven't got it. Well, I would say that, wouldn't I? Well, folks, I think we're done. This meeting, believe it or not, is being recorded. Hello. Um, still getting some comments. Um, we're chipping through here. Um, that's about it. I don't have any more questions. Cronin claimed that the, the, the creativity is in design in the robots. Yes, that's probably true. <laughs> well, the age of the robot is about to come your way. And I think with that, I say goodbye. Have a good afternoon. Keep safe.
one new method. Uh, and um, that's it. I'll see you next time when Alan and Bromfield would be talking about radioactivity. And medicine is usually in medicine. You always give a good talk to make sure you sign up for it. For now, bye bye. Bye, everybody.